I don't want no oil A spoil in my shoreline I like fish much better than crud I like birds and things A creeping and crawling Won't trade no more oil for blood The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run But that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting And I do believe it's time we was done I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. No nukes! Good morning, Toledo, and good afternoon, Columbus, and hello to those of you listening on the internet, wherever and whenever you are. This is Joe DeMar, along with my co-host, Rebecca Wood. And we are happy that you have tuned into For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a program where we talk about ecology and the environment. And we talk about it in terms of how it's going to affect you, your family, your health, your wealth, your pocketbook, your happiness. And there is a ton to talk about this week. Wow, we we were off last week, we had, so we had a, a pre-recorded show play in there. Um, and uh, But this week we're back and we have quite a show lined up. Uh, we have, first of all, we're going to have in a little bit a guest, uh, Daryl Stockberger, who works for the municipal utility at Bowling Green, Ohio, and he is going to be talking about this new technology of utility scale battery storage for the grid, which it sounds doesn't sound very interesting, but it's actually kind of revolutionary. The idea that you can make batteries that are literally big enough to, to power a city, and uh, that technology has, is fast becoming very practical, and so uh, it's most, most likely going to be part of a green, sustainable future. And so we have, as we, we are always on the cutting edge here at For a Green Future, we're, we're going to have somebody who is knowledgeable about the subject, and we're going to talk all about it. Uh, then there's a lot of news. We're going to be talking about some stuff going on down in Houston, uh, an update on the whole Burger King South America connection. Some studies have just come out which have proven things, which we environmentalists have been saying for decades. And, uh, you know, it, that's one thing about being an environmentalist is it's so often you're right and, you know, you know you're right and – but then we're told, wait for the pr proof, wait for the studies, wait for the science. And so, yes, the studies and the science come along decades later and prove that we were right all along. Because very often science, science turns out to support common sense. <laughs> True. And, uh, but, but now it's 20 years later, and things that could have been done to prevent damage, things that could have been done to help people that were being hurt, weren't done for those decades while we were, while we were waiting. Uh, and so, uh, but nonetheless, when the studies come out, it is good to, to go back and, and talk about them, if only to say, I told you so. You know. <laughs> there, <laughs> because, you it was know, fun. That's one of our few fringe benefits of being <laughs> an ecologist these days, is we do occasionally get to say, you know, we said that 20 years ago. Kind of every time the news comes on now. <laughs> right. And, of course, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about the climate strike, which uh, the worldwide climate strike that happened on Friday, um, in which uh, we actually had things happening here in Toledo, and Rebecca was at the Toledo climate strike. And, uh, of course, we'll also be talking to you. at uh, eight six, if You can call in at any time at 866-240-1065. Uh, we'd love it when you call. We prioritize your call. We'll, we'll drop everything. And, in fact, we'll pick stuff up just in order to drop it, yeah. you know, to answer your call. Um, 
That's 866-240-1065. And, uh, of course, there will also be an update on House Bill 6, the, the controversy that won't go away. And it's actually a good thing that House Bill 6, this controversy, isn't going away because if it ever just stops, that means First Energy has won. That, Let's not all just learn to like it. Right. This is This is something... This is not one of those things that you should just grudgingly accept. This this is uh, something that needs to be uh, fought and continuously fought, and uh, make you know make First Energy earn every one of those dirty dollars that they're taking out of our pockets. So. Indeedy. All right. So um, so while we're waiting for uh, Daryl Stockberger to call in, he should be calling in at about 8:15. I do want to start with talking about the situation down in Houston. So probably you've seen the news. It's been on all the TV. It's been on the Weather Channel almost nonstop. Houston right now is underwater. It is being pummeled by a tropical storm, and the water levels are just amazing. Some of the, In some of the areas, they're approaching or passing record flooding levels. And this happens to be the third quote-unquote, 500-year storm in three years down in Houston. And this this is a result of global warming. This is a result of there being too much carbon dioxide in the air and the air being too warm. And so what happens then is the air can hold more moisture. And so then when that moisture falls out in a storm or in, in rain, it can be at catastrophic levels. It can so kind of more of an annual storm, unless a 500-year storm now. Right. <laughs> the, the annual catastrophe is upon us. <laughs> That's a good way to put it, the yes. annual catastrophe. I, I like that. Um, but there's also something else going on in Houston besides the flooding that we should all know about, and that is that Houston is a state which has passed one of these laws that make protesting that affects quote unquote critical infrastructure a felony. Mm. And so uh this these laws were being put into place well they're being proposed all over the country. Uh th- there's one proposed in Ohio right now. It's called Senate Bill thirty three, SB thirty three, which has been languishing in committee for a, a month or two, a couple months here, uh, because the, the legislatures didn't want to push SB 33 through right on the heels of HB 6. In other words, you know, they didn't want to appear to be employees of the, the utility companies and the, and, the, and the fossil fuel industry. But what these laws do is they make any sort of protest against any part of what's called a critical infrastructure a felony so that protesters can go to jail for years, 5, 10, 15 years. They can face huge fines, $100,000 fines. And so Greenpeace went down to Houston, and they they went out there, and they had a little protest where they took rowboats and kayaks and and little motorboats, and they delayed, they blocked boats that were leaving Houston carrying natural gas out to the rest of the world. And so they they did a protest. They were saying, this is insane. It's got to stop. No one was hurt. This delayed the boats by like a day or two. So it's, you know, the multi-billion dollar companies that are making the profits off of these things were not hurt at all. They were just making a protest, making a point. But now they're going to be tried as felons. So it's worth thinking about the, the situation there. What you have is a city which is literally drowning. It's literally going under. And as the city is going under, as the floodwaters are rising, the courthouse is being pummeled with uh, global warming-induced precipitation. The rain is pounding on the windows. The waters are rising. And inside the courthouse, they're, they're trying people as felons who did a nonviolent protest against the fossil fuel industry. Maybe they can try trying the weather as, as, uh, as felons also. Maybe that will stop it. I don't know. <laughs> That's a that's a thought. Just put the tropical storm on on trial. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's the one causing all the damage. Exactly. Right? It should be held responsible. 
That's a it's an interesting point. <laughs> As in, completely insane, you mean? Mm-hmm. Well, yes. well, yes. So, but of course, what we have to do is we have to stop using fossil fuels. We have to stop using natural gas. We have to stop using coal. We have to stop using oil. And the sooner we do it, the better for ourselves, not just future generations. You know, those those hazy babies off. Uh, you know, beyond the horizon, but for ourselves personally. I mean, you are more likely to be able to live your whole life in your house without your house being destroyed by a storm or by a tornado or by something like that if we can wean ourselves off of fossil fuels. And the sooner we do that, the better. Or maybe for the several thousand people who have gone missing in Bermuda, say, for example, upset about that, well, you know, there are things you can do to prevent that from happening again. Right. Yeah, that Hurricane Dorian, Category 5, when it hit Bermuda, 185-mile-an-hour sustained winds. Uh, people really don't understand the the um, the amount of energy in a 185-mile-an-hour wind. It's very hard to comprehend because we're never usually exposed to it. But if you've ever stuck your hand out your car window, let's say, you're going at 90 miles an hour, mm-hmm. you can feel the force on your hand. Well, the for- amount of energy in the wind, the amount of force in the wind, is the cube of the wind speed. So think about how much force there is on your hand with a 90-mile-an-hour wind, and then you don't double that at 180. You cube it. So it's not twice the power. It's two to the third times the power. So it's... It's two times two times two, so it's eight times as powerful as a 90 mile an hour wind, and it's it's just insane. But uh, enough talk about insanity. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about sanity. And, and one of the sanest people I know is uh, Daryl Stockberger. Daryl, are you with us? Uh, yes, I am. And good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, thank you, Daryl. Um, we well, first of all, could you just uh, say what your title is, who you're with, and so forth. I am the Assistant Director of Utilities uh, for the City of Bowling Green. All right, and we're very grateful to have you on the line with us. And what we wanted to talk about today were, was battery storage. Um, we're reading more and more about the idea that we can store uh, energy produced perhaps by intermittent sources like wind and sun in these giant utility-scale batteries. And so we're just... We know that Bowling Green is looking at the possibility of of adding that to their municipal utility grid, and we're just wondering about the basics of these uh, huge batteries. How do they work? Um, What scale are we talking about? And so uh, anything you could do to help us understand this would be great. great. And if anyone has a question for Daryl, you can call in 866-240-1065. Sure. Uh, Very uh, basically, uh, with the uh, current technology uh, uh, being used most commonly uh, is the uh, lithium-ion battery. Uh, That is the same battery that you use in your computers, uh, you use in your cell phones, and uh, is most widely used in uh, in electric cars. Uh, Yes, I have Uh, a Pacifica hybrid, a Pacifica, a Chrysler Pacifica hybrid, which uses the lithium-ion batteries and it's just fantastic. I love it. But go on. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, you get very good performance from a lithium-ion battery. Uh, there are other types, of course, uh, but this is the most developed uh, uh, at this point, <clears throat> in large because it is lightweight <clears throat> for the amount of uh, power that it packs and works very well, <clears throat> therefore, in the uh, automobiles, but also for stationary purposes, Uh uh, when uh, uh, you have your uh, your computer today, uh, it operates for a much longer time period uh, than uh, the original laptops did. Uh, this uh, technology has uh, come a long way. It uh, it now uh, has longer lasting batteries. Uh, they can be discharged much more deeply uh, without uh, uh, without harming the uh, the battery. And so. Uh, uh, it is well suited for many applications, and uh, uh, in our case, uh, uh, utility scale, it's not just a giant lithium-ion battery. What it is is thousands 
of smaller batteries that are uh, uh, put in uh, uh, individual packs and uh, uh, and then uh, connected together uh, to create the uh, the high voltage. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the individual battery might not be much bigger than the one, say, in a car, but but because there's yeah. thousands of them linked together, that it can it can hold a lot of power. Uh, that's correct. Uh, that's exactly the concept. And in in our case, uh, uh, we were looking at uh, uh, approximately 10 megawatts of wow. uh, peaking power. And uh, uh, part of the thinking and the reason for our recent uh, request for proposals uh, is that we have five diesel generators, uh, each almost two megawatts uh, each. Uh, they're 1.8 megawatt. Uh, Caterpillar diesels. Uh, they came of an age where uh, uh, they were ready for retirement and uh, wasn't practical to uh, improve their air emissions to bring them up to uh, standard uh, for today. And uh, so we've got the infrastructure in our substation, uh, which, by the way, is located out uh, by the wastewater treatment plant. You see these units provided backup for our wastewater plant uh, uh, as well. Uh, but they were primarily for peak shaving uh, uh, use, just uh, like we might anticipate the batteries would be for. Uh, but their original purpose was to <clears throat> uh, provide the backup power for the uh, run of the river hydro that the city uh, participates in uh, down at the uh, Belleville Lock and Dam. Mm-hmm. And so uh, well, now- that use is is no longer needed because uh, we have different uh, transmission rules than we had back then. Okay. Now, you, you used the term peak shaving, and uh, I think let's just take a moment and and talk about what that exactly is. Well, in in uh, in our case, uh, uh, the peak shaving that we need is for the uh, peak that is coincident with the peak of both First Energy and the PGM, uh, the regional transmission uh, uh, area, uh, the uh, uh, coincident peak uh, uh, with the whole region. Uh, reason being, the whole system is built uh, to handle that peak. Mm-hmm. So, like, and so, uh, so you're saying, so for an example of of a peak, is that something that would happen daily, or is that like? when you have 110 degrees and everyone's running their air conditioner? Yeah, this this particular peak uh, here in our uh, area uh, is exactly that. It's uh, it's an air conditioning peak, hmm. and uh, uh, that happens uh, uh, almost exclusively in the summer. Uh, granted, every once in a while we have uh, something, you know, called a polar vortex that brings extra cold uh, weather and uh, can cause a spike in electricity use. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, six times a year, uh, we set a peak, and the whole system has to be able to meet that peak. And so uh, the uh, the way uh, it is uh, calculated for our cost is our contribution, our city's contribution to that peak load on those uh, uh, five days for the region and one day for uh, uh, First Energy. Uh, that is used in the calculation for our transmission charges and capacity charges mm-hmm. for the whole next year. I see. And so that's far more important than trying to just shave our city's peak mm. uh, because uh, that peak is not coincident typically mm. uh, with the region. It's uh, it's off just a little bit, and so that doesn't contribute to the regional cost in the same way. Uh, that we contribute on these other peak days. Uh-huh. So having the, the capacity, the ability to come in with this power when it actually can lower the electric bills for everybody in the municipal utility. Exactly. Uh, and uh, that is uh, uh, that is where the savings go when we uh, are able to operate efficiently like that. And the, the diesels worked uh, uh, well for that. Uh, and they leave behind an infrastructure. Uh, the interconnection uh, was there, 
and <clears throat> you know, so all the conduit, uh, the uh, the slabs for those diesels. The diesels were in containers that are almost identical in size to the containers that the utility scale lithium ion batteries would go into. <laughs> and so it it made sense to us to make some use of uh, the older infrastructure. See the the concrete slabs, of course, uh, they have a lifespan that's uh, uh, that's you know greater you know than the uh, uh, the steel structures for the diesels. Huh, so reduce, reuse, and recycle there. That's, that's on the power plant. It's a re- yeah, yeah, it's a it's a reuse uh, certainly, yeah. and you know the idea that. Uh, uh, the uh, capacity uh, is basically two megawatts. Uh, uh, it, uh, it's our thought that uh, perhaps a lower cost installation of batteries could be put in mm-hmm. uh, to take the place of those diesels. Ah, ah. Well, I hope that project goes forward because I, I think this this is part of the future. And uh, in fact, there's this past week there's been in the news a story about L.A. just signing a deal where they they are doing a combined solar and battery storage uh, program, and the solar is going to be huge. It's going to be out in the desert, but the battery storage, they're looking at 1,200 megawatt hours of uh, battery capacity, which is uh, just kind of mind-boggling because Davis Bessie Nuclear Power Plant puts out about 800 megawatts, and so... You're talking about a battery bank that can put out more power than a nuclear plant for like an hour straight or, you know, half the, for two hours and so forth. That's how batteries work in terms of megawatt or watt hours. Yeah, I would say that very few people imagine the technology at that scale, you know, just as recent as 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so it is one of these technologies that's that's – dropping in price and it becoming more practical um but there's there's other uh utility scale battery technologies being talked about though even though they're not being rolled out the way the lithium ions are um yes uh, absolutely uh uh not just uh, batteries of course uh yeah, but as we all know there are uh, a lot of different battery technologies Mm-hmm. Uh, some of them better suited than others, and uh, some of them for you know uh, one purpose versus another. You know, like lead acid battery works very well uh, starting your car, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and it's low cost, uh, but it doesn't have the uh, uh, the cycle lifespan uh, of the lithium ion, uh, nor does it uh, pack as much uh, energy and as light a weight. Uh, but there are also, uh, you know, longer lasting flow batteries. Uh, it's just a matter of cost and the, uh, the development of lithium ion in the, uh, uh, for the automotive industry. Uh, that concentration on the technology gave it its boost. Uh, but electric, uh, uh, energy, uh, storage is not a brand new concept. Uh, in fact, uh, pumped hydro, for example, has been in use for um, you know, many, many years, uh, mm-hmm. when, uh, when there is, uh, uh, excess electricity available from hydro, uh, they, uh, actually utilize, uh, pumps to, uh, pump the water up to a, uh, pool in a high elevation. And then when they need the electricity, say when the water flow is less available, uh, then they are able to uh, call upon that. Uh, also, uh, air has been used, uh, salt caverns, uh, uh, mm-hmm. for example, uh, or, uh, or other, uh, solid rock, uh, mines, uh, that can be sealed and, uh, compressing the air when the, uh, uh, power availability is high or it's low cost, uh, and then extracting that, uh, air to generate electricity or, uh, to, uh, uh, feed that compressed air into a gas turbine for high efficiency. Uh, right. Those technologies have been in, uh, in use as well, or flywheels. Uh, and all of these are still being developed and modernized. Uh, flywheel, for example, uh, that used to be uh, a good technology primarily for uh, smaller uh, UPS systems on uninterruptible power supplies. Uh, but they have uh, been able to use... Uh, 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 technologies uh, 
that have reduced the friction. Uh, they uh, can elevate the uh, flywheel with ma- uh, with magnetism, <laughs> yeah, uh, well, reduce I- the pressure on the bearings, and, and so now you can uh, you can get something almost equivalent to a lithium ion battery. Wow! So so basically, a, f- a flywheel is just this big weight, this big like rock that you start it spinning. Uh, and when you've got excess energy, you, you get that flywheel spinning, and so then when you need the energy, you take that power back. And you use the spinning weight to generate power instead of uh, storing yeah, but, it. So yeah, that's but, that's correct. Uh, but mag maglev uh, flywheels that does sound like futuristic. There, the <laughs> huge weights <laughs> well, floating in the air, spinning around. That's a de- kind of a fairly ancient technology, is it? Though I mean, yeah, flywheels use it for things the, for a long time. <laughs> they, yeah, they've been around since the days of the steam engine. Right. They and and I don't yeah. know if they were used before that, but. But yeah, basically the idea you you get a, a big mass spinning around and you can that it stores energy. So yeah, that's that's cool, Daryl. And uh, I guess there's also some talk of I find it kind of interesting. One of the very first batteries, of course, were wet cells that sort of chemically stored the energy. And I, I guess there's even wet cell batteries on the horizon that use things like uh, sulfur to just store the electric power and then bring it back when it's necessary. Uh, yes, there's a, a good number of different uh, uh, different chemical uh, formulas that uh, uh, that will store and uh, release uh, electricity. Right. The, uh, the research is uh, is always ongoing, and uh, uh, it is impressive. Uh, even some of uh, the really old technologies are coming back with new twists. Uh, I've seen large uh, thermal storage where they uh, can use uh, uh, resistance heat to heat up, uh, for example, a large mass of lava rock and then uh, uh, actually uh, apply water, make steam, and use that to turn a turbine <laughs> at a later time. So, Why not? Cool. Yeah. All right. So the, uh, the, the insulation is the key, you know, to make it, uh, make it longer term and uh, uh, store it for a later later use. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, uh, hydrogen. Let's not forget uh, that, uh, particularly renewable uh, sources of energy being used to uh, to make hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen can be stored. Uh, it can be put in pipelines. Uh, it can be blended with natural gas. It can be used in vehicles uh, very efficiently, either the internal combustion engine or, uh, more expensively uh, to date, uh, uh, the fuel cell. Uh, mm-hmm. So um, uh, hydrogen doesn't have anywhere near the limits of uh, of time that's expressed in the use of a battery. You know, with a battery, it's difficult to store like solar energy during the summer when you have a lot, and keep that for long term use in the winter. Mm-hmm. Whereas hydrogen uh, could be stored for uh, a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. It, it... So, yeah, as long as the hydrogen is being generated by a sustainable source. I mean, if you're, if you're using coal to generate hydrogen, you, because you lose energy every time you do a transformation like that, you, you'd be better off just burning some, the coal directly. But So as long as it's like coming from a clean source, a wind, a sun, um, then, yeah, there's a lot of potential there. And so that's one of our points on For a Green Future is that the potential is there. We just need... The political will we need to the, the societal will desire to apply all these technologies which we know about and which are there and and they're increasingly being applied and so that's I find this an encouraging sign the, the question is just are we going to apply it fast enough or are we going to make this switch in time so um, so thank you Daryl for that fascinating glimpse at a at a future technology, which is coming into play. Yeah, as you say, I, I don't think anyone could predict that batteries of this scale would be available by this time. It's kind of amazing how rapidly that technology has advanced. I would agree with that. Yeah. All right. Well, Daryl Stockberger, thanks for being a, a guest again here on For a Great Future, and uh, we always appreciate you having on and, and your depth of knowledge on these issues. So uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you too. Bye. All right. So we have reached the bottom of the hour and 
plenty of time for some calls at 866-240-1065. That's 866-240-1065. If you want to talk about the battery storage idea or any environmental topic that uh, that interests you. However, right now, since this is a commercial station and we're at the bottom of the hour, it's time to do a couple commercials. Uh, one of the sponsors of For a Green Future is the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature, restore wildlife habitats, and they lead outdoor adventures. The Wood County Parks protects 20 parks and nature preserves all around Wood County, which are open from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year, rain or shine. And if you want to find out more about Wood County Parks, you go to www.wcparks.org, or you can call them at any time at 419-353-1897. And they also have an app now that you can download on your phone and, and get information if things are happening. They often have these really cool things come up, like they have a monthly na nature book club, that if you're into natural readings, you go read the book and get together talk with other people. Uh, sometimes they have, like they had a craft beer tasting not long ago that I went to that was a lot of fun. So you search for their app. It's simply WC Parks. That's their app. And, of course, w Wood County Parks also gives you a lot of opportunities to volunteer, to get out into nature, and to physically get your hands dirty, helping the environment, doing things like removing invasive species, planting native species, cleaning up areas that have become polluted. Um, and at any time you want to register to volunteer, you go to the website wcparks.galaxydigital.com. That's wcparks.galaxydigital.com. And I'd recommend you do that because we talk about so many stressful things here on this show. And there's really nothing better for dealing with that kind of stress than actually getting out into nature, taking a hike, or getting out, putting the gloves on, and tearing out some of these invasive species and planting the native species. You know, it's, it's good to, it's much better to actually do something than to just sit and worry about things. So. I've talked to people from the uh, the Botanical Garden and the Lucas County Parks who um who their their whole job, you know, in the summer is going out and pulling out invasive species, which if you think about it, their job is picking flowers. That's like a job for a fairy. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So all right, so that's uh Wood County Park District, one of our sponsors. We're very grateful to have them. Uh, our other sponsor for this hour is Demar Consulting. Uh, DeMar Consulting is a computer consulting company, and the difference is that they will come to your home. So if you've always wanted a computer expert at your beck and call, uh, all you need to do is call DeMar Consulting, and they'll come out to your house. They'll help you back up your computer. They'll help you if you have a new computer. They'll help you install your new software. They'll help you with whatever home computing needs you might have. Maybe you've got a new printer, and you don't want to, figure out how to hook it up yourself. They'll come out and for a very reasonable charge, uh, they will hook it all hook all that stuff up for you so you don't have to worry about that. Um, DeMar Consulting, at DeMar Consulting, everyone who works there has a degree in computer science, so you know that they know what they're talking about. And there's two ways to reach them. One is to simply go to their website, which is at demarconsulting.com. That's D-E-M-A-R-E then the word consulting, with no dashes or periods or any of that fancy stuff. Just demarconsulting.com. No umlauts. No umlauts. <laughs> Nowhere is there an umlaut to be seen. And uh, the other is to call them directly or text them at 419-973-3000. That's 419-973-3000. Demar Consulting for all your home computing needs. All right. So now we are on to... Uh, some general environmental and ecological news here for the rest of the show. And, uh, of course, taking your calls at 866-240-1065. And there's a lot, a whole bunch of ecological and environmental news came out this past week. 
And uh, one of them, unfortunately, I have to give an update to a conversation uh, Becca and I had a few weeks ago, a connection between Burger King and the South American deforestation that's going on. Um, there's been a lot of criticism of companies like Burger King because once the forests get burned, they're replaced by soybean fields. And then those soybeans are used to feed the cattle that then go into our hamburgers. And so we are literally eating the South American rainforests because the, the nutrients in that soil go into the livestock that get turned into our hamburgers. So, so Burger King has been criticized for their participation in this, and Rebecca brought, brought that up a few weeks ago. I wasn't able at that time to find a straight-out connection, but since then I've done more research, and yes, it does look like Burger King is still involved in the companies that are getting the soybeans from South America. They have made a pledge to stop using that, to stop using deforestation, uh, grown soybeans. <clears throat> Unfortunately, they've promised to stop doing that by the year 2030, which means... After it's all gone, right, probably, yes. Which means <laughs> that they would, <laughs> they would stop deforesting after the deforestation is complete, then they and won't... I, prom I, I promise to stop eating dodo birds and passenger pigeons, too. Well, that's very good. Because I care. Yes. <laughs> Those birds are both extinct, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So so that's the situation. Uh, Burger King by no means is alone in, in getting those kinds of uh, South American sourced beef and soybeans. But they are alone in the, their pledge to stop by 2030. A lot of the other chains have pledged to stop much quicker than that. And so... Burger King is still available for criticism on this topic, so unfortunately. Now, I had one of their, uh, was it Impossible Burgers or whatever oh, it was, a couple was weeks it? ago. It was pretty good. I don't know. I I liked it. Yeah. I've heard really good things about it, and I ha I'm going to try one. I, I'm not sure that all fast food burgers are magical anyway, so I'm not sure, you know. Right. But if you really, really loved the, the Whopper, I don't know how you're going to feel about this, but I thought it was all right. The thing is about our current situation, okay, we're going to get all socioeconomic here. You've got Donald Trump who has started a trade war with China. Mm -hmm. So China is no longer buying U.S. soybeans. Oh. Right, because China has said, okay, you want a trade war. We'll give you a trade war. And since they're a dictatorship, they just said, okay, no more U.S. soybeans. All those contracts are void. And so here in the U.S. we have – warehouses full of soybeans, and we have fields that are full of soybeans, which no longer have a purchaser. Good thing in Ohio we couldn't plant anything this year because of the rain. Right. <laughs> so. And then we have a company, Burger King, which, has made, which is, has made this new Impossible Burger, which is made out of soybeans. Okay. Oh. So, and instead of buying exclusively U.S. grown soybeans, which would go over, you know, which would be a huge boon to U.S. farmers, they're still using contracts with South American soybean growers. Oh, great. Where they're destroying the, the rainforest in order to get those soybeans. And so this is one of those situations where it's painfully clear all Burger King would need to do right now is say, we're stopping our South American contracts, we're going to buy those soybeans that China has turned down. And it would save the, help save the American farm. It would be sourcing locally, you know, growing U.S. soybeans for U.S. Impossible Burgers. It would save the rainforest. It's one of those, if you're looking at things ecologically, it's one of those no-brainers. That's what we should do. But if you, you think. Yeah, but if you look at things through the prism of of money and through the prism of where's the most profit and all this stuff it you know now things get all confusing and shady and you just keep cutting down the eating the rainforests rather than uh using this resources that we have right here in ohio in the in our, within the listening range of our radio station ohio farmers should be selling their soybeans to burger king right now that's my opinion 
That's an idea, yeah. yeah. So anyway, um, we environmentalists have lots of opinions and ideas, <laughs> and one of the ideas that we've had for a long time since the Three Mile Island accident is that the levels of thyroid cancer and leukemia around the Three Mile Island plant are among the highest in the country. And this week, this past week, a study has finally come out that definitively links the Three Mile Island radiation releases to the thyroid cancers that are happening in Pennsylvania around Three Mile Island. And the reason they were able to do this is because they've studied the Chernobyl mm. uh, increases in thyroid cancer, and it turns out that getting cancer from the radioactive iodine released from a nuclear plant has specific subtle differences from thyroid cancers that are got, gotten from the general environment, from the, the natural radiation, we'll say, and, and the natural pollutants and problems. And so this study has finally come out and said that Yes, that's true. And, Supporting common sense. <laughs> and we've been, we've been saying that for decades, but I, I it's a study done by Penn State, and there's been other studies that have supported this idea, but it hasn't been conclusively, you know, the, the industry has just dismissed those studies, but this one is so detailed and so specific, and the science is so strong that they finally have to admit that it's happening. So something I think... It's good for all of us to take a moment to listen to. And let's also take a moment to listen to our caller. We have Gary from Michigan. Gary, welcome to Hi. For a Green Future. Thank you. I uh, finally get a hold of you. I, uh, I'm i about 100 miles away in Michigan and have trouble getting that station up here. Ah. But I've uh, well, been we're... trying for a while to catch your phone number, and I just got it. Oh, we're uh, glad, you, glad you made the effort. So you're actually listening uh, on the radio Right now, or are you yeah. on the internet? Okay, all right, great. Yeah, radio, radio, yeah. It's good to um, know our signal gets that far. That's great. Well, not much from the Toledo area that gets up here. I had a heck of a time just trying to find out that, that what was going on with the UT game last night. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I, I'm sure they'll be talking about that on, uh, you know, as soon as this show's done, the sports come right back on 106.5 <laughs> The yes. Ticket and. You know, Mick Gonzalez is going to be on next with uh, with the cheap seats, and I'm sure he'll be talking about it. But, yeah, go ahead, Gary. Let's see. What, what... Um, I uh, have uh, BBC uh, going on uh, all night long, really. I, my, I uh, turn on the radio, and, you know, they have a lot of good stuff on BBC, and unfortunately it runs through the night, the good stuff. Mm -hmm. science, etc., and they had a terrific one last night on uh, climate change. Uh -huh. And uh, the, the the big thing, and I, I'm going to get on the Internet and start spreading the word on uh, that myself. I, uh, I've uh, taught environmental and physics uh, uh, at uh, universities uh, in this area in Iowa, Oh, nice. And uh try to participate in this stuff as much as possible, but it's a little difficult for me now, and especially at my age, to be running around the country the way I used to. But uh, the um, they had a panel discussing the situation, and I didn't catch all the fell asleep in and out of this. But the the thing that really uh, made sense was is to you know, we have certain politicians that try to uh, change the terminology so that it uh, has a different kind of an effect. Uh -huh. Like, you know, when they change it from uh, global warming, warming to uh, uh, climate, change. climate change. Yeah, a, a change and we different. refuse to make here on For a Green Future. We're, we call it global warming, but go ahead. Okay, the one that one, one of the uh, guys said, uh, was that uh, we should also change the reference to the climate deniers to climate destructors. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, that's a good one, yeah. Climate and, uh, you know, these, these people, I didn't get the whole thing. I missed the first part of it. I woke up and started hearing this stuff. There's, there's the 
apparently all uh, scientists at uh, different institutions in uh, uh, England, and uh, there are about three or four of them. But uh, this one woman, damned idiot, says that this kid's situation is doing more harm than good, that these kids don't know what the heck they're doing and that they're being manipulated. I uh-huh. mean, billions of kids that are are uh, on this campaign, and I, if I had any way, I would be underwriting them, supporting them, giving them money, whatever, because they're doing one heck of a lot of good. Yeah. And the the other two or three guys on there just beat the heck out of her after <laughs> she made that statement. I, I didn't catch anything else she had to say, but she obviously was uh, on the side of the the uh, politicians that are promoting economics rather than uh, the environment. All right. Well, but, yes. Uh, well, yeah, we will be talking more about the climate strike in just a minute or two here. So, so thanks. Yeah, I, I, I'll be curious about that because uh, I, I would like to participate if there's anything within 100 miles of where I am, but uh, I have a heck of a time finding out what's going on. I, I participate when possible with the Northwest Ohio, Ohio uh, Peace Organization, mm-hmm. uh, which uh, m- right now with uh, the uh, uh, Davis Bessie thing, there, you know, the one guy, Lodge, Terry Lodge, is really big into that. And I heard what you said last week about mm-hmm. that, and I really appreciate that you you have done what you have and the information that you provided yet is some things that I had right. never heard of before. All right. Well, thanks very much, Gary. And, uh, yeah, keep listening when you can. I appreciate the call. And actually, we have a uh, we have another caller coming on the line here. But um, very quickly before we take that caller, I just wanted to uh, mention the fact that um, Becca was at the climate strike and she'll, here in Toledo, and of course the climate strike happened literally all over the world, and. Uh, it had, there were several thousand, I know, in Cincinnati. There were a couple thousand in Columbus from the looks of the pictures. And uh, actually, we have a, a call from Carl from Toledo. Ooh, all right. Okay, Carl, go ahead. You're on for a green future. Oh, hey. Good morning. Good morning. I think it's interesting that you brought up Three Mile Island. There was an article in The Blade just the other day saying they're actually shutting down uh, the nuclear power plant at Three Mile because it Oh, not efficient enough to compete with natural gas electric generation. Yes, you you can't see, see my face right now, Gary, but I am grinning from ear to ear because mm-hmm. yes, Friday was the last day of operation for Three Mile Island Unit One, and uh, it's a great thing. It's a great day. Whenever a Mazel tov. Yeah, whenever a <laughs> nuclear plant shuts down, I, I allow myself a, a day of bliss <laughs> because there we've one spot that we stopped generating these horrible nuclear wastes. So, yeah, it, it just shut down. And as you say, they claim the reasons are economic, that they can't compete with uh, natural gas, with wind, with solar. And, uh, yeah, that is that is a great thing. That Yeah, whatever, whatever it takes to shut them down, I'm in favor of. <laughs> well, here's the other interesting thing is I don't see the people of Pennsylvania being asked be charged a fee to keep it going, like well, we are here in Ohio. Yeah. Well, actually, Gary, they did ask. The, the uh, Exelon wanted a bailout the, the same way that uh, First Energy did, but there in Pennsylvania, I guess democracy is a little bit stronger, and the legislators care a little bit more about what the people think, and uh, it was voted down. And so... Um, that was a great thing. That was a good day for democracy because the, just like in Ohio, the, the outrage about a proposed bailout was incredible, and it came from all the sectors of Pennsylvania society, just like it did here in Ohio. The difference is that in Ohio, of course, the legislators and the governor went with the first energy, and there the legislators and the governor went with the people. So, yeah, they, they asked for a bailout, and they didn't get one, and that's why they're shutting down. But we have another chance <laughs> to shut that down. That's true. Coming so, up. Yeah, so that that's the uh, the petition to over, to overturn House Bill 6, to put it on the ballot as a referendum. And we will be talking about that shortly. But, yeah, thank, 
Thanks for the call, Gary. Thanks for bringing okay, up thank you. Three Mile Island. Thank I, you. Bye-bye. You made me happy. <laughs> All right. And so uh, speaking of happiness and happy events, there was a, a global climate strike on Friday that uh, millions of people, uh, estimates around 4 million with uh, like about half a million in the U.S., got out in the streets protesting climate change, protesting our continued dependence on fossil fuels. And it was a, a wonderful global event. And it, we had a, some experience right here in Toledo. And Rebecca, you were at the Toledo climate strike. And uh, how, what did you think? How did you give us a report? It was very nice. We were down in uh, Levis Square off St. Clair there, right by the first energy building, I guess, appropriately enough. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm told there are about 50 people which is pretty good for Toledo. There's nothing like, you know, the big cities or even Cincinnati, I guess, had, you know, a river of people in the streets, which was nice. Mm-hmm. But it was a nice, you know, respectable, festive little cloud, crowd, um, very nicely intergenerational. You know, we had some actual children and among the speakers, a couple of teenagers. Okay, the teenagers, it was hard, you know, because teen- they're just very embarrassed by their existence. So <laughs> they showed a lot of courage um, mm-hmm. and, and some adults, you know, people from different walks of life, you know, newcomers. Mm-hmm. It's it's amateur hour around here y- anymore because uh, because people are suddenly getting interested now that they're large parts of the world are underwater. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I think that I think the whole sus- spectrum of society is finally getting engaged on this. They had old issue. people who have been working on it forever or old people who have children and grandchildren. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think one reason that Cincinnati might have had so many people is because Cincinnati is downwind of this um, coal plant, which is getting bailed out in House Bill 6. And so there's a charge being added to their electric bill to create the pollution that's causing asthma and respiratory disease in Cincinnati. Oh, yay. And so so the idea that we're going to not just continue, but we're going to prop up these uh, polluting carbon fuel sources is, is especially harmful down in the southern part of Ohio. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah. Clifty Creek is the name of the... Clifty Creek, the, huh. ...of the, the horrible coal plant that's going to get that would get money from house bill six uh but uh so that brings us to our house bill six update which Indeed. which we seem unable to avoid these days um the house bill six battle has gotten ugly uh the the i like to call them the the obnoxious minority the, the obnoxious minority <laughs> that you know they they are promulgating these lies about House Bill 6. They're saying that it would uh, give our grid to China, and they're putting out television ads, and they're putting out flyers that are going out to all the registered voters in Ohio, telling them not to sign the petitions. And the thing is, yes, if if you actually outlaw wind and solar in, in, in this country, as bills like House Bill 6 are doing, then probably China will make the stuff. Yeah. Because we're not doing it. Right, because we won't have the same kind of reliable grid that they have. But so what the House Bill 6, what the people gathering petitions are doing is it's putting that bill, which has already passed the legislature, been signed by the governor, puts the bill on the ballot as a referendum, which gives us Ohioans the opportunity to overturn it. We get to veto the government, the state government, as a as Ohioans, if it gets on the ballot. If the referendum process fails, if we don't get the referendums through, then the law goes into effect and all the horrible things that we've been predicting would happen. Which, you know, it, it could well prove on unpo- there, There's reason for all this hyperbole and outright invention on, on the, the part of the opponents of this referendum because um, – it could well get voted down on account of it, it tax a lot of random money onto people's electric bills. People right. don't like that in Ohio. Exactly. People really don't like that at all. And I have to do a disclaimer here. I am no longer working for the company, which is uh, gathering the petition signatures. But I do want to report that while I was, I was, uh, I came in contact with one of these blockers. The, the people who want House Bill 6 to pass have hired thugs, 
Uh, that's the mm. word I'm going to use to describe them. And what these thugs do is if they spot, if they can find a petitioner, they try to surround them. And then they yell at the people who are considering signing the petitions. They scream at them and say, don't sign that. You're giving the grid to China and make it very difficult to gather the petition signature. So it's gotten really ugly. And it's really a case of democracy versus dollars. They've hired thugs to prevent you from exercising your right as an Ohioan to have a, a say in the laws that are going to govern you and affect your personal Or even discuss it. Finances. What are they so afraid of? Right. All it's doing is putting it on the ballot. So if you see a petitioner, sign their petition. And if a, if a blocker starts yelling and screaming at you as you do, just ignore them because uh, they are hurting our democracy. They're hurting our energy future. Please, uh, let's let's overturn House Bill 6. All right. You're here. That's our show for this week. Thank you all for listening. And please, if you want more information on how to sponsor For a Green Future, just go to patreon.com and search for For a Green Future. So uh, that's it. And as always, we're very grateful you've been listening. And Rebecca, thanks for co-hosting. And uh, all right, we will be Thank back. Thank you, and everyone have week. a good week. All right, <laughs> bye.